Let's pray. There is no other name given in heaven, on earth, under the earth, whereby men might be saved, except the name of Jesus. What a powerful name that is. It's a name that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And Father, I know that that means every knee. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Father, that means me, each and every person in this congregation, each and every human being on this earth, each and every entity, those who are under the earth, those who have rejected you, Satan and his demonic horde, that he led her to be in one day. One day, they will bow before you in humility and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. Father, I pray that you would use us as your people point people to that name today, tomorrow, in our life, in the short time we have on this earth, to point people to that name so they do not have to wait till they have no choice, but they will willingly bow before you now and call you Lord and Savior. Father, use us to do that. Father, I thank you for your grace that allows us to do that. That when we had no hope in your love, you reached down. You drew us to yourself, convicted us, and then saved us when we called out to you. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Be glorified today in this service. Father, open up our hearts to your truth. Thank you, Father, for your cross. Help us, Father, to grasp a little better, a little more so, the love that you showed, the love that Jesus showed. Help us to grasp a little better, Father, what you made available. Father, help us to begin to walk in that. Father, you have made us one with you. You have placed your very spirit, your life in us, which was your plan all along. Your desire was for Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of life. They chose the wrong tree. Father, thank you for your cross. Now, Father, open up our hearts to your truth. Help us to truly seek, Father. And I thank you for your promise that if we'll seek you with all our heart, we'll find you. Father, I know that this is for us as human beings an ongoing process. And Father, I believe it will be that for eternity. That you're going to continue throughout eternity to reveal just a little bit more of yourself moment by moment to us. But Father, you've also uh, said that you would do that now. So help us to see you, Father, to know you a little more intimately. And Father, as you reveal yourself, we cannot help but praise and worship. Father, I, I just wonder if there's no, if there's no worship in our heart. Do we really know you? 
we just go through motions? Do we, how can we do that? Understanding who you are, what you've done for us, and your great love for us. So, Father, I just praise you and I ascribe to the glory that you possess right now, Lord. Open up our hearts to your truth as you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Glad you're here. Don't forget about tonight. Uh, keep that in, uh, in your prayer. But Come tonight. See if God will uh, impress upon your heart what he's doing, what he wants to do, how he wants to use you and us as a church. God is not finished with us. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. He's got a plan. He takes a little long sometimes doing it. <laughs> or so we think. We walk by faith and not by sight, right? Okay. Uh, any questions over what we have covered so far? Okay. Got it all down, right? Turn to Romans chapter 6. This is something we started on the other, night, uh, other day, a couple weeks ago. I'm going to start with the... Um, I'm going to start with verse 5. We've, we read this, but I want to I reiterate what we talk, talked about. And we're going to... I'm going to try to... Uh, but let me just read it. Romans 6, verse 5, For if we have become united with Him... So you know, we become united with Him. We are one with Christ, right? One with God. If we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self, that word self there is in most cases translated man. So it simply says, knowing this, our old man was crucified. Fact. It happened. It's not a position. It happened. The old man was crucified with him. That our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. There is so much, so much in here. Let me go back to this, uh, this, this term that, that mine, my Bible says in, in verse 6, the body of sin. And when it says might be done away with, this body of sin, this power of sin, in other words, what it's saying, it's not that, that it's, we don't have to deal with it anymore because we know that's not the case, right? We know we deal with that all the time, that there is a battle, there is a struggle that goes on. That's what we're trying to, uh, to show and to see. And guys, if we can understand and grasp this, we'll once again see part of what the cross has done. How will we be new creations? This power of sin that we're going to be talking about, I'm going to, I'm going to read to you in the Greek what that is, might be done away with. That word is translated might be done away with as kartigio in Greek. It's the same word used about, uh, that Paul uses in other places, talks about we're not under law. So in other words, the law, he, he speaks about it, it's fading away. But he also says it's, it's powerless. If you read Romans, you'll see that if you hook yourself up with law, you give law power over you, and it kills you. In other words, if we hook ourselves up to law, we're bound to sin. And once again, Romans says that the law came that the transgression might increase. So the law came to make us sin more, to break us, bring us to an end of ourselves. So when we hook ourselves up to the Ten Commandments, which is part of the law, what am I going to do? I've got to keep these. And what do I end up doing? I end up breaking them, right? Well, when we taught this uh, uh, study uh, years ago on uh, we're not under law, we're under grace, uh, I said a, a common example Two common examples that I see so much, and it's and you can you can feel this happening inside you when it says stay off the grass, wet paint. What do you do? Get on the grass and you touch it. 
you know. The, client, the, the sign clearly says, wet paint. And I got to touch it. I gotta, that's what the law does to us. Don't do this. The power of sin energizes that in, in, our, in, our, in our brain, to, then goes to our mind. We bind to it and we try to do it. We had a guy at work. He was a, he was a foreman when I first, hired, I first got in maintenance in a mill rights years ago. He was from uh, Portugal. And uh, they, were, they were working on this, they were building this thing of metal. So it was welding and cutting and all that kind of stuff. And it come break time, well, the person was working on it. Of course, it was red hot. So he takes the soapstone and writes hot on it. So we go take our break. What's the first thing a foreman did? He went up and grabbed it. It's got hot and he picked it up. That's why he's a foreman. <laughs> That's what I tell Tony all the time. <laughs> you know? That's what the powers, that's what the, the law does to us. But it says that we are free from that. This power of sin energizes that we are free. To be free, we are truly free, but we've got to learn to walk in that freedom. He said, for he who has died is freed from sin. It's not, so if we are just, as we've talked about positionally free, I mean positionally uh, dead, then we're just positionally free. We're really not free. But it says the old man died he who has died, and therefore we now, the new man, the new creation, we are free from sin. Does that mean we are free that we never sin? That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the power of sin. I'm going to read what, what the Vines uh, Dictionary of the Greek and Hebrew language says about that. That word sin is harmatia. It's harmatia in the, green, uh, in the Greek. And basically the word means to miss the mark. That's the general Easy definition, to miss the mark. In other words, God set the mark up here, perfection. We strive for that mark, or we shoot our rifle or a bow or whatever at that mark. We miss the mark. We never hit that mark perfectly. That's why Jesus did. So God could view us as having done that. So that's what that word means. But I want to show you something. To show you what Scripture says, at least a little bit further down, that the power of sin is the culprit. It's not me. It's not the new man. That's not the problem. What Jesus did was enough on the cross. We're having to learn to walk in it. Drop down to verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey Whose lust? My lust or sin's lust? Sin's. Do you see that? We're not talking about acts of sin here. Acts of sins are not in our mortal body. It's the power of sin. Okay? Let me read this to you. Let me find it first. Okay, this is from the from Vines Dictionary of the Greek and uh, Hebrew language. Of course, the first part it says a harmatia sin is that simply means literally to miss the mark. All right, part B, it says sin, a governing principle or power. Then it gives an example, Romans six six, the body of sin. Here, sin is spoken of as an organized power. Acting through the members of the body. I don't know how to explain it other than the fact of taking it what it says. That there's some kind of power, some kind of force in my body that scripture refers to as the power of sin. It's not talking about the acts of sin. It's talking about a power or force that's in my body. And that's what verse, t uh, verse 12 tells us. Therefore, do not let sin, do not let the power of sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey its lust. You see that? The power of sin is the problem. It's not the old man because the old man is dead. He's been crucified. You know, we talked about the name of Jesus, you know. Uh, he set us free. 
we were placed, as the old man, were placed into the body of Christ. The old man was crucified with Christ. And the new man, the new creation, was raised up to walk in newness of life. So what Jesus has done is enough. So if we sin, it's because I bought into that right there. But here's the thing about it. It's, it's kind of tricky, you know, because we think when these desires and all that pops up in our, in our, in our mind that it's my mind doing it. I'm being attacked by the power of sin. And this is, I don't know how this works. I've got no clue. But somehow or some other, Satan uses this to cause us to buy into the lie and sin. So as the new creation is a new creation, which is holy, perfect, sanctified, blameless, is a new creation going to have all these evil thoughts? No, the new creation's not. But what happens is the power of sin that's located in my body speaks to my mind, and at that point, I buy into it, and then it becomes me. Then I have bought into that lie, and then I choose to act out. See, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let the power of sin reign. See, we have a choice. There's a choice there. Do not let the uh, power of sin reign in your body. So we have a choice because of what? Because of Christ, because of the cross, because of the fact of who I am now, because of the fact that I am a new creation, totally a new creation. But I still live in this mortal body. So somebody asked me once, well, you know, when is that taken care of? Well, when this body dies, where's the power of sin going? It's, 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 there's nothing for it to reign anymore. It's not even, its presence is not even there anymore. But as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to have to fight this battle. And here's another key that we have to learn. If I fight this battle in my strength, what's going to happen? I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose. If I hook myself up to a bunch of rules and regulations, which Paul clearly talks about in Romans, that if I do, it's going to kill me. And that's what happens. I walk around like I'm a dead man, sinning. So we have that choice, though. So who, who am I going to let reign? Am I going to let the Spirit of God, the new man, reign? Or am I going to let the power of sin, Satan's agent? Because here's the bottom line, right? Paul makes it clear in Ephesians. Our battle is what? Not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, against the rulers of this age. For the time being, for the time being, even though Satan is defeated, it's a done deal, for the time being, God still allows him to have a certain amount of influence. And he uses that greatly, doesn't he? And especially in the whole world system, which he is the God of this world system. But we are not of the world system. We have to live in it. We don't have to buy into it, though. So there's, there's where that, that battle comes in. There's where the battle comes in. So it's not that God hadn't done enough. It's the fact that he's teaching us day by day, moment by moment, to rely on what he's already done, to rely on his life, his spirit in me, his power in me, He's to, to actually walk in victory so that sin, Satan's agent, does not reign in my body. But the cross is enough. Okay? Any questions? And that's kind of hard for us to grasp, but, when, if, but, if you'll, but if you'll, there's multiple places in Scripture. Uh, I can give you all kinds of places where it's used this way. And until I really grasped that fact years ago, that it's not talking about acts of sin. And if you, if you think about it, and you go back, and I went back and I read so many of these things, and I got to thinking, how was, how was I even doing it? It really didn't make sense as an act of sin. Uh, this was kind of a revelation to me when I, when I began to understand this. And like I said, I, years ago I knew, uh, and I've, I've related this before, that I knew that when I was asking for forgiveness for everything I'd ever done, you know, and I did it day by day and so forth like that, and finally it just dawned on me one day, said, this is not going to work. This simply will not work. 
So I began to go back and look at Scripture and everything and begin to look at what Scripture said about me. And I began to see, little bit by little bit, what the cross did for me. So here's the big thing I think is really important in our walk. How, how, how is it practical? When I sin, and I still sin, right? When I sin, when you sin, it's your fault. It's not God's. It's your fault. And we don't like to hear that, do we? We like to blame it on somebody else. It's your fault. It's my fault. When I doubt, it's my fault. Now, I understand circumstances just surround us sometimes, overwhelm us sometimes. But God has done enough. God's promised to never leave us, to never forsake us. But what happens? The power of sin, Satan's agent, attacks my mind. It comes into my mind. I buy into it as truth. And then I act upon it. Or then I think about it. Then I dwell on it. We all do it. Every one of us do it at different times. But it's not because God hadn't provided a way. But here's the fantastic part about that. God understands. It's not an excuse, but he understands. His grace is sufficient. When I fail, he's right there. I understand. He picks me back up. Dusts me off. He says, trust me. You'll get through this. And sometimes it takes a while, doesn't it? Because we can all attest, in some more than others, that it doesn't stop necessarily instantly. You know, Scripture says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You know, Lisa and I have had that conversation. I said, yeah, Lisa, that's, that's true. It's absolutely true. But it doesn't say how long we have to resist before he flees, does it? Sometimes he comes and comes and comes and comes. And it just wears you down. Why would God let that happen? There might be multiple reasons, but one reason is going to be this. To still, sometimes we still want to hang on to the fact that I'm going to buckle down, I can do this. I'm going to do this. No, I'm not. I'm never going to do it on my own. You know what Jesus said? Again, outside of me, you can do nothing. Well, I can do some things outside of Jesus, right? That's how we approach it sometimes. No, nothing. So God's part of his plan is allowing this sin, this power of sin in our body, is to continue to remind us that I need a Savior. I need someone to walk the entire my body so that I can bind to the truth. I'll never do it on my own. I need that Savior. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, I want to go on then and touch on the, to show where Paul dealt with this himself. If you would turn to Romans chapter 7. This is a passage that's very familiar to, I'm sure, almost everybody here. But when I found finally one day, several years ago, 20 years ago, when I was in a process of really learning bits and pieces of this, of this, uh, this battle and everything, how much I had just read and read over and never looked at what it was actually saying. And it was because it was very confusing until I began to grasp about the power of sin and so forth. So let's start with Romans chapter 7, verse 15. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For, not, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. All right? So Paul, he's readily admitting here, right? 
I don't understand. This is, I, I believe this is probably early, early in his, his, his walk with Christ until God began to reveal. He's kind of letting you know the, what, the process he went through to understand this. Paul understood, I believe, that he was a new creation. He changed, right? There was no question that Paul changed. He went from persecuting the church to preaching Jesus. And if we, we can't really grasp what it would be like for a Pharisee to do that. You know, totally steeped in Pharisee Judaism, knew thousands and thousands of laws by heart. Didn't have to read them, he knew them by heart, by memory. So he knew that he had changed. He had experienced the saving power of Jesus in his life. But he knew there was still a battle going on. He said, I don't really understand. The things that, I, that I'm doing, the things which I'd like to do, I'm not doing. But I'm doing the very thing, singular, thing that I hate. So, did Paul say that he as a new man enjoyed the thing or that he hated the thing? He said he hated it. But we get involved in things. We think, hey, this is all right. This is fun. I think I like this. Is that really coming from the new creation? Or is it coming from somewhere else? Paul said he hated it. Was Paul different? Was he a different kind of, I mean, there's no doubt he was more mature. But he was a human being too, right? He said he hated the thing. He's doing the very thing he hated. And he's not doing the thing he liked. Verse 16. But if I do the very thing which I do not wish, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. What's he saying? He's saying the law is doing its job. It's eating my lunch. It set a standard. I can't keep the standard, so therefore... The law is doing what God designed the law to do. Remember, the law came that the transgression might increase. So when God gave us a law, he required, he required the Jews to keep the law, knowing they would never keep the law, so that it would fulfill its purpose, that they'd realize they could not keep the law and they needed a Savior. But the Jews missed it. They hooked themselves up to the law they couldn't keep the law. They went into captivity. So what'd they do? They come up with more laws. More laws that they couldn't keep. So Paul says, it's doing what he's supposed to do. It's showing me that I need a Savior. Verse 17. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now make sense of that for me. Paul just got finished saying that I'm doing the very thing that I hate. But then he says it's no longer me that's doing it, but it's this sin, this pious sin in me that's a culprit. That's clearly what he says here. Let me read it again. But now no longer am I the one doing it but sin which dwells in me. So is Paul saying that, he, that when, when he, he was sinning, it's not him? It wasn't his fault? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is he recognizes that the power of sin is a culprit. It's the power of sin that generates this, this thought, this desire. Not Paul, not the new creation. It's the power of sin. So this power of sin in my body attacked his mind. Paul then bought into it and acted out what the power of sin generated. Questions on that? Like I said, it's, it gets kind of complicated. You know, I read, this, I read this for years until I started breaking it down word by word. I didn't grasp what it was saying. And it seems to be double speaking. But if we understand that there's a power of sin in our body. And that is the culprit. That's what I have to war against. And that the power of sin in my body attacks my mind. How many things do we do 
And this gets back to what we was talking about before, Walter, about the mind and the brain being different. How many things do we do by habit or because that's how I've been trained to react? And we talked about before snakes, right? First thing, you see a snake, see a spider. You jump back. Well, that snake and spider probably didn't do a thing. Probably wasn't attacking, probably wasn't doing anything. But because I've been trained that way. Think about how many things, how many psychologists tell you that, you know, every time you learn something, there's another wrinkle in your brain and so forth. Lisa talked to a, to a lady who's a, a psychologist and she was going through all these medical things. I, said, I told her, I said, see, that's exactly, in a way, what Scripture's saying. We've got all those things that we've been trained to do that, it, that are habits that we do without thinking sometimes. That the power of sin energizes in our brain. But the problem is we buy into it with our mind, with our, with our inner being. The mind is part of the inner being, which is the new creation, right? We are a new creation. So we buy into it. And I make it myself. And then I let the power of sin reign in my mortal, my mortal body by carrying it out, acting upon it. And scripture says, I don't have to do that. But because I've been trained this way, I do it over and over. So I, I seen an example one time, and I think fits very well, is that let's say we have these habit patterns in our, our brain that are like this. I've learned to react to, to a certain thing that's this wide. But I realize through the Spirit that it's wrong, that I'm buying into a lie, that this is not of God. So over time, as I continue to reinforce that, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it has less and less control over me. As long as I'm still in this human body, there's always that remnant in that brain that's there. That I was trained by the enemy a certain way. But it gets easier to learn to resist. But if I let my guard down, and I depend on myself again, what happens? Bam, it hits me again. Where I have been rejected, it may be for years, I crack the door. How many times do we do that? Do we crack the door? Well, a little bit of sin. A little bit of thinking wrongly. What happens? Most every time, that door gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Till the next thing you know, the whole barn, the whole barn doors are open, both of them. And it floods in again. That's what we have to deal with. But Paul clearly says that I'm no longer the one doing it. So what, he, what he's saying is, I'm not the one. The new man is not the one who's generating it. It's, it's fault. But it's the power of sin. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my body. So in and of himself, Right? There's nothing good in and of himself. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing is not. So Paul says all day long, you know, I wish I could do certain things, but I don't have the strength to do it. I don't have the strength to do it. But the Holy Spirit in me, God's presence, the new man energized by God's Spirit can do it. What's the verse we like to quote all the time? You know, when... Uh, Things happen, and we, we struggle and everything. I can do all things through Christ. Do we really believe that? I taught this class years ago one time, and I got so much pushback because it appeared to be the statement that we don't have to sin. Because if we, it, that's what Scripture teaches us, but if we really bind to that, then I've got to admit it's my fault, and we don't want to do that. And where does that thought come from? I mean, the Spirit of God, the new creation that says, yes, God, I sin. I want to repent. That's where, that's where the Spirit of God is going to lead us instantly, right? But I've got to admit it. If I never admit it, repentance never comes. So if I struggle that much as the new creation, binding into the lie, think of how the struggle is with those who do not know Jesus and have never had the Holy Spirit in them. Think how impossible. See, we, so we see once again God's grace just abundantly flowing that I could even say, help God, I need a Savior. 
is all by God's grace. And yet I still got that responsibility. Okay? Any questions? I'm going to stop here, give you time to think about that this week, and I'll continue on next week. We'll finish the rest of the chapter. Do you have any questions? I know it's a lot to think about, but either the cross was enough or it wasn't. And that's what you really have to determine. Is the cross enough or if it wasn't? Now, like I said, there's lots of other things we've got to discuss eventually. What is reality now? What will be reality? Well, it gets back to a human perspective and God's perspective. And remember, we, I said at the very beginning, God's perspective is reality. So those are some of those truths that we do a study like this that we've got to hold on to. It's just like you've heard me say many times that we got to, when we start, when, when tragedies come, when uh, heartaches come, we have to hold on to the fact, we have to start with the foundation that God is good. If we start anywhere else, we're going to go off, off the track. So in this study, God is good and the cross is enough. Jesus, what Jesus did was enough. Okay? Any questions? Think about this. Read the rest of, you know, I mentioned last week about reading Romans 7. Read the rest of it this week. In Jesus' name, amen.